Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Can I welcome you all to today's meeting of the Public Petitions Committee? And as always, can I ask that uh, you switch off any uh, mobile phones or electronic equipment because it does interfere with our sound system. I'm afraid the weather has led to a couple of casualties this morning. We've got delays with Angus MacDonald and Chick Brodie, but we are hoping that they will appear sometime uh, during the committee proceedings. Um, agenda item one. Um, a decision on taking business in private. The first item of business seeks the committee's agreement to take agenda items six and seven on external research and the committee's work programme in private. Does the committee agree to take these agenda items in private? Agreed. Thank you very much. Um, agenda item two is considerations of new petitions. The next item of business is a consideration of two new petitions. The committee agreed to invite the petitioner to speak to one of the petitions. The first new petition is PE 1531 by Ashley Husband Poughton on removing charitable status from private schools. Members have a note by the clerk, the spice briefing and the petition. Um, the committee is taking evidence this morning via video conferencing from the University of Hands and Islands in Orkney from the petitioner. And could I remind members, because of the technical aspects of the video link, a delay will occur between members finishing their questions and the witness hearing from them and responding. Equally, there will be a delay the other way around. Because a video link has been used, it's important that no one tries to speak over anyone else. Therefore, members should speak only if called to do so and not try to interrupt a colleague or the witness, as this will affect our ability to hear the answers. Could I welcome the petitioner, who I can see in front of me. Hopefully you can hear us uh, from Orkney. Uh, I'm, I'm David Stewart, the convener of the committee. And if I ask, first of all, my colleagues can introduce themselves. John Wilson, MSP, Central Scotland. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Anne McTaggart, uh, MSP for Glasgow List. Good morning, David Torrance, MSP, Kirkcaldy Constituency. And good morning, Jackson Carlow, uh, West of Scotland Regional Member. Uh, thank you, colleagues. Um, could I again welcome uh, Ms Poughton to, and invite her to speak for around five minutes. And after that, I'll kick off with a couple of questions, then invite my colleagues to also ask further questions. You have five minutes. You're very welcome this morning. Thank you for attending video, video link. Thank you very much. I'd like to begin by saying how thankful I am for this opportunity to address the committee, so thank you for this invitation. Fundamentally, charitable status and taxpayer subsidy for private schools is inappropriate and unjust. This charitable status means that all taxpayers, including the poorest amongst them, are subsidising the rich and the privileged to privately educate their children. It corrupts and derides the true spirit of charity, that is, helping the needy and the most vulnerable in society. And when we consider the true spirit of charity, it's very difficult to understand how private schools can come to be classified as charities. The committee will be aware that to qualify for charitable status in Scotland, there are three central considerations. The first of these is that public benefit must be provided. The second, that this benefit must not be outweighed by this benefit. And the third, that access to the benefit must not be unduly restrictive. Now, on all three of these accounts, private schools would appear to fail. In terms of public benefit, only around 4% of pupils in Scotland attend private schools, and this figure becomes even smaller when taken as a percentage of the whole population at less than 1%. To put it in another way, over 99% of the public do not benefit from the education provided by these schools. Even more significant, however, is the staggering detriment of private schools to society. As borne out by extensive academic research, and allowing for the education of children according to the social status of their family, private schools are at the very heart of a society divided by inherited wealth and privilege. They entrench and they perpetuate social inequality. I recently graduated from the University of St Andrews, where over 40% of Scottish students have attended a private school. Scotland's most elite private schools charge fees in excess of £30,000 per year. To put this in context, Average pay in Scotland is £26,472. A cleaner earns about £8,000 a year, a care worker £12,000, a bus driver £23,000, a nurse £26,000, a teacher £32,000. It is extremely difficult to contend that access to these schools is not unduly restrictive, and it is undeniable that for the majority of the Scottish population, a private school education is far beyond their reach. I'd like to stress, and I would really like to stress, that this fact is altered not in the slightest by the provision of a few bursaries, and it really is a negligible amount when you look at the figures. These are a symptom of, not a solution to, the issue that access is granted by the ability to pay. 
shifting the privilege ever so slightly does not get rid of it. I hope in these opening remarks I have made clear how charitable status and taxpayer subsidy for private schools is at, at its most basic, morally wrong and entirely at odds with the true meaning and sentiment of charity. Furthermore, by reference to the charity test of the OSCR, I hope I have made clear the difficulty I have in accepting the legitimacy of the status quo, given the very limited provision of public benefit, the unduly restrictive access to it, and most importantly, the huge disbenefit of private schools to society, given their clear role in perpetuating social inequality. The recently published report of the Social Mobility and Child Poverty Commission stated that child poverty is set to rise and warned that the UK is at risk of becoming a permanently divided society. 20% of children in this country already live in absolute poverty. In an era of increasing and profound inequality, of brutal austerity and cuts to public services, I find that I am just one voice amongst an increasing number that are very uncomfortable with the anomaly that is the charitable status and the taxpayer subsidy of private schools. I will now do my best to answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you very much for your submission and keeping within time. That's very impressive. Um, can I kick off with a couple of questions? Um, I mean, are you satisfied with the current uh, Charlesville test overseen by um, Oscar, the Office of Scottish Charities regulator? I am, yes. I just am creating their, their conclusion to, to award charitable status to private schools. But I'd also suggest that there are two options I see, and one is that as I hopefully pointed out in my opening remarks, working even according to the current guidelines, you could conclude that they're not charities. Another option would be to just exclude from consideration all private schools on the basis that the, the sole criterion for access is the ability to pay, and you could just exclude all schools on that principle. And, I mean, obviously I'm not here, nor is the kidney, to argue a case for Oscar for or against, but what Oscar are saying is they are merely complying with the rules laid down by Scottish Government. Let me give you one example. I looked at their website last night in preparation for today, and out of random I just clicked on one school, and that was, on, and that was FETIS. And they said mm -hmm. that um, they actually did the initial analysis, and FETIS actually failed the charitable test, changed their guidelines, and now satisfy the test, and are complying with charitable status. So you could argue that in fact the regulation is working perfectly adequately in Scotland. Why do you, how would you respond to that? Yeah, I'm very aware of the Fetis case. They, they failed in 2013, as, as you said, and they then increased the proportion of the school rule on assistance from 9.6% to 10.6%. And my question for the OSCR would be, why is 10.6% support OK, but 9.6% wasn't? Why does 10.6% support fees to make fees of over £30,000 a year unduly restrictive. I don't, I don't think it, it makes any difference to, to the overall unduly restrictive nature of access to these schools. And as I hopefully made clear in my opening remarks, no amount of bursaries changes the, the fact that these private schools shouldn't be allowed to, to qualify for charitable status. No amount of bursaries whatsoever changes that. Would it be fair then to characterise your petition as saying put to one side any sense of the current regulation we have via Oscar, effectively what you want to do is remove charitable states from private stroke independent schools per se, and that is it. You want no regulation. You want a clear, I feel like, ideological change in the current rules. Would that be a fair summary of how you feel about this? Yes, yeah, certainly. I think that would be the clearest way forward. But as I pointed out, even working according to current guidelines, it's, it's very questionable to give them charitable status. But yes, yeah, for the sake of clarity and just on principle, I think the best way would be to just exclude them from, from consideration full stop. That's very clear. Could I bring in, first of all, uh, Jackson Carlo? Thank you. Good morning. Um, could I ask which private schools you visited uh, before presenting your petition? I have not visited any private schools. So you've never visited a private school, so this really is not, this is just a, a, an opinion in abstract rather than one with any direct experience of the benefit any private school might provide? No, it's one based on extensive academic research and the experience of a brilliant state school education and the experience of extreme inequality, educational inequality, having attended St Andrews University and yes. seen the result of the privilege and elitism in the education system. Interestingly, St Andrews University qualifies for charitable status but charges fees to international students, as do colleges, universities, all universities. They're all College of Physicians and Surgeons. There are lots of academic institutions that charge fees 
uh, who have charitable status. Are you proposing that the charitable status be removed from them as well? No, because in the case of universities and colleges, um, the ability to pay is not the only criterion for access. You also have to have attained certain grades, write a personal statement, this sort of thing. Whereas private schools provide general compulsory education, otherwise provided by the state, and the only criterion for access is the ability to pay. So there's a big difference between universities and colleges having charitable status and normal schools which provide general compulsory education. That, of course, is your assertion that the only criteria for entry into an independent school is your ability to pay. But, of course, you've not visited any private schools and you haven't actually asked any private schools yourself whether or not your assertion is vindicated. You say that it is a subsidy. Of course, it's an indirect subsidy in the sense that um, money does not get paid to the exchequer. Uh, how much does it cost to, in to educate a child in the state sector? It's an average of about £5,468 per pupil. £5,468 per pupil. So if, 33, so if the 33,000 students who are currently in the independent sector required to go to the state sector, the state sector would have to find 33,000 times the £5,000 pounds that you suggested the individual education of a student costs. Is it not therefore the case that by not sending 33,000 students to the state sector, you could argue that in fact those people who have their children educated independently are subsidising the state sector by not placing that additional burden on them? And where would the Scottish Government find the money for the 33,000 students if these independent schools were not there? I think there are, there are a few points to be made in response to, to what I inevitably anticipated would come up as a point, that, that private schools save the state money. The first point to be made is that this is fundamentally not a point about finances. I'll address the finances in a second, but this is fundamentally a point of okay. fairness. And Sorry, no, no. Thing. Excuse me. The question was not, it wasn't to ask you about fairness, it was to ask you to answer my question, which was about the finance. Yes, I'll come to the finances. Sorry. Um, I think that could you, the, excuse the me, excuse me, um, could just remind members, particularly those just come in, that because we're doing it by video conferencing, it's important that we don't interrupt either the witness or fellow members. So, carry on. But we do need to answer the question. Yeah. It's just a technical yes, point, Mr. Um, Carroll. Carry on. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so, as I said, I've got a, a couple of points to make here. As I've said, the, the first point is that I'd really like to stress that this is a, a moral issue as opposed to a financial one, but the financial issue can be addressed as well. Firstly, if private schools were no longer to have charitable status, they would save the state even more money, if, if you want to maintain that that's what they do. Secondly, the longer term and the wider consequences of charitable state, of, of private schools in society, that is their role in social inequality and perpetuating a, a divided society, the costs of that to the taxpayer and to the government in terms of health inequalities, housing inequalities, employment inequalities, is arguably, if not demonstrably, much greater than whatever money the, the private sector saves in terms of per pupil spends. And lastly, saving the state money is not one of the recognised charitable purposes. So if you've ended up having, as your only argument in defence of charitable status, the fact that private schools save the state money, which is disputable, it's not a charitable purpose. That, that's, a, that's a point to be had with regard to whether or not private schools should exist or not. But as for their charitable status, Saving the state money is, is not a charitable purpose. Yes, but there is a requirement to deal with consequences as well, rather than just the high principles that you think are demonstrably, although I would say only arguably, potentially evident. Um, lots of community groups benefit from uh, the independent sector because they are allowed, as a result of the charitable status, to have uh, considerable access to the use of the school's facilities out of school hours. How many of the thousands of community groups who benefit in this way have you spoken to about the potential loss of their access to those facilities? I have not spoken to any of them, but I do not doubt for a second that private schools without charitable status would still have enough money to provide these services if they so wished. Not and I also would point out that the provision of community services, like bursaries, cannot be allowed to mitigate what is the overwhelmingly negative role of these schools in society as I pointed out at the very beginning, public benefit is provided to an extent, but you also have to take into account the disbenefit of societies, of, of private schools, sorry. So you, you can say, yeah, they provide benefit, they give a few bursaries, they provide community services, but the disbenefit still outweighs this 
negligible benefit that's provided. The polemic is entertaining, but it would be helpful if you just contained yourself to answering the questions rather than giving us your general political philosophy. So, the fi sorry? Yeah. The final okay. question that I just want to, you, you haven't visited the schools, you're not clear whether community groups who might lose access would, uh, what their opinion of that would be. You're not clear how the Scottish Government would fund it. Can I ask finally, would another route be, uh, instead of um, withdrawing charitable status from the independent education sector, to extend charitable status or to adjust the tax arrangements so that all the, all the schools in the state sector benefited equally from the tax status which is made available to the Royal College of Physicians, Surgeons, Colleges, Universities and the independent education sector. Would it not actually be the right move to allow the, in the state sector schools who currently do not enjoy this benefit to have this benefit extended to them as well? Yes, I completely agree that state schools should have charitable status, but I would still remove it from private schools. Um, can I ask other colleagues who wish to come in? Um, start with Chick Brody. Good morning, and I apologise for being late. Uh, what it did do for me in travelling from here this morning was afford me the opportunity to listen to uh, the uh, director in charge of independent schools, state school, uh, independent schools. <coughs> I'd like to come to that in a minute. Um, I wonder if you could clarify whether or not one of, one of the conditions that um, an organisation, a charity organisation, must show whether any condition on obtaining a benefit, including any charge or fee, is unduly restrictive. Do you, th you mean clearly, from your view, you think that is the case? Can you give an example of why, where you think that uh, restriction applies? Yeah, I'm not sure if you missed my opening remarks. I, I beg your pardon. I'm sorry that. for that. Yeah, that's okay. That's fine then. Um, I'll just repeat myself a little bit then. But um, Scotland's most elite private schools charge fees in excess of over thirty thousand pounds a year. For example, Fessies College is £10,060 times three for three terms. And if, to put this in context, the average wage in Scotland, the average pay in Scotland is £26,472. A cleaner earns on average 8000 a year, a care worker 12000 a bus driver 23000 a nurse 26000 So looking at this, it is, it is undeniable that for the vast majority of the Scottish population, the privilege of a private school education is far out with their reach. So it's, 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 for me, it's, it's impossible to argue that access to these schools is not unduly restrictive, given the staggering tens of thousands of pounds of fees that they demand. Okay, yeah, um, thank you for that. That, that uh, uh, explains, you know, it gives me an answer to the, my first question. Second question, I was slightly bemused having come in. I know I was dizzy, but, you know, I compounded by the economic uh, juggling of, of, uh, of Jackson Carla, because, of course, clearly, if... Uh, if, if we're talking about moving uh, uh, public school students to state schools and the cost, of course, there's a saving in the, in the, uh, in the state schools. Can you explain, in, in, you know, for my benefit, very slow this morning, uh, how uh, we can get to a situation where we have uh, schools like FETIS, Glasgow Academy, no doubt, uh, have a, say, the, saw the tax liability fall from the likes of 209,000 to 41,000, which is a taxpayer-funded subsidy of 167,000. Can you just take me through the mechanics of that? Sorry, I didn't quite follow your question. Well, when you in, in, the back, in your background information, you were saying that, that a private school, and, and, you, and you named several of them, uh, but just let, let me take one. So it's tax liability fall from 209,000 to 41,000, which is a taxpayer-funded subsidy of 167,000. What's the mechanics behind that? Uh, that is due to private schools receiving 80% compulsory discount on non-domestic rates due to their charitable status. It's, it's not the only tax benefit they, they get. They also don't pay corporation tax on profits. They receive gifted on cash donations and other examples. Thank you. One last question. In listening to uh, the, the, the gentleman responsible for the running of independent state schools, or at least the, the policy, he was unable to tell his questioner this morning 
how many bursars there are in independent, in, in, in independent schools. Unable to, I suspect, because he was, wasn't very sure of his numbers, uh, how, what the income uh, levels are of those that attend, including bursars. Uh, is that information available anywhere? Is the information of, of the number of pupils on support available? Yes. Yes. Um, why wasn't he sorry, able to I've tell? Why wasn't he able to tell? Why was he not able to tell the questioner then? Um, he he would have been able to tell them if he'd had the information at hand. I can give you some examples here. Um, currently, six pupils at Fetties are on 100% support at 0.8% of the school roll, and six pupils uh, at St Columbus School it's 1.6% of the school roll. And that's, that's generally the case. The number of pupils on 100% support tends to be absolutely negligible. Furthermore, it appears to be the case that the bursaries that are awarded are made less in a spirit of charity than after repeated coercion from the OSDR. Um, what, what, private schools often fail the test and then are deemed to pass it again after they've upped their provision slightly. And that's what happened to, to Fetis. I'm not sure if you were present for that part of the conversation or not. Fetis failed the charity test last year. Uh, they then increased the proportion of the school role on assistance from 9.6% to 10.6%, at which point they were deemed to pass the charity test. And my question then was, why, why does 10.6% assistance mitigate fees of £30,000? And is that not a very arbitrary and ultimately unjustifiable decision to come to, that, that this level of support should mitigate unduly restrictive fees? I certainly don't accept it. Mr. Brody? Thank you. Just, I, I said last question, but I have one other. Uh, given that you, clearly you're in, you, you know what the numbers are, is there any information regarding the income distribution of the uh, households from which the students to private schools, you know, from, from their households? Is there any inform information that indicates the distribution of the income in, private, in, in, in these households? Not that I'm aware of at the moment, but given that if, if fees are an ex, you're going to have to have disposable income of at least £30,000 a year, so you're definitely talking about the richest and the most privileged in society. I think that's quite safe to say. And yet they're funded. They've got taxpayer-funded subsidies, most, most, of the, most of the major uh, private schools. Yes. <laughs> OK, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Brody. Could bring in other colleagues? John Wilson. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, given the petition that's before us is about the charitable status uh, of the, the fee paying schools, do you think Oscar has correctly applied the rules as established in 2005 to those fee paying schools? Because clearly you've highlighted, uh, and the convener made reference to FETIS being able to change. Uh, their whatever it is, memorandum and articles or whatever uh, criteria Oscar were looking at to allow them to get charitable status. Do you think that was correct of Oscar to do that at that time? I don't know. And before starting this petition, I wrote to the, this uh, Oscar twice and it was only due to the unsatisfactory nature of their response on both occasions that I then decided to petition the Parliament because obviously I need to direct my concerns to, to the body to whom the Oscar is, is accountable? I have to make a declaration. I've not got a vested interest in an uh, independent school sector, and neither uh, my child uh, didn't have anything, uh, any dealings with an independent school. Uh, Mr. Carlo's assertion that you have to visit an independent school to understand what an independent school does it almost implies you need to be in a war zone to understand what war means for many people. So the reality is, is that many people, and I think and the question I would like to ask you, do you think your petition is one step in trying to eradicate the independent school sector in Scotland? Yes, I'd, I'd hope for it to, to continue like that. And Professor Brian Boyd has also given me some remarks to quote today, and that was, the, the conclusion of his remarks as well, he said the first step towards that goal, that is making it illegal to charge money for education akin to countries like Finland, um, should be the removal of charitable status, triggering a debate on the contribution education can make to the achievement of a more equal society. That was Professor Brian Boyd, a professor of education at the University of Strathclyde. To the issue that was raised by the convener in relation to 
uh, fetters and re reapplying or being able to adjust their application to Oscar to receive charitable status or continue to receive charitable status. Do you think the value of the number of bursary students uh, attending fetters outweighed the value of any benefits of having charitable status? Sorry, could you repeat that question? Uh, the question was, uh, and I'll rephrase it, it's the, regarding the, the indication you gave is that FETIS uh, increased or ad adopted, adapted the rules to allow them to receive charitable status. And I'm assuming that part of that would have been due to the number of bursary students that the FETIS accepts. And do you think the value of adjusting the number of bursary students is sufficient to justify the value of having charitable status? Yes, I think for these schools, the, the, the bursaries that they provide are actually negligible in terms of the total income at their disposal and in terms of the actual school role. As I, as I said, I'll restate the figures. Six, per, six pupils at FETIs are currently on 100% support. That is 0.8% of the school role. And for that, they get a status which, which legitimizes them. Um, it it legitimizes them from, from the point of view of the government and from the point of view of the public or rather the, the Oscar speaking on behalf of the public, and I don't think they should be given this legitimacy and this freedom of conscience. They should, they should be forced to accept what they are, and that is that they, they perpetuate and entrench social inequality in society. They educate children according to the social status of their family. Thank you, Kim uh, Thanks, Mr Wilson. Uh, can I now invite um, other colleagues, particularly those who haven't yet asked a question? Uh, I've got a little bit leeway in time, so I'm happy to keep this debate going a bit longer. Uh, could I bring in Angus MacDonald? Yeah, thanks, Convener. Um, I've certainly followed this issue uh, since it came to my attention um, about 15 years ago, uh, where it was discussed at length within our, my, uh, my own party. Uh, and then subsequently, I believe it was highlighted um, in 2005 in, in, in Parliament. Um, I should declare that uh, I am a, a product of a, a private school, uh, although perhaps not maybe the best example of <laughs> or the best advert, but um, Nevertheless, uh, I did attend uh, uh, a boarding school. Um, can I ask, uh, Ashley, um, you, you mentioned uh, Finland as an example of, of a country where uh, charging for private education is illegal. Um, have you looked at Sweden, where private education does seem to be uh, spreading uh, quite significantly, uh, which is clearly just next door to, to Sweden? Have you looked at that example? I have not looked at that example, no, and when I referred to Finland, it was actually quoting Professor Brian Boyd. I'm aware of it to some extent myself, but his papers are a lot more in-depth and detailed than anything I can tell you on international comparisons and things like that. Okay, thanks. Um, as I say, I, I followed this issue for, for some time, and um, when it was discussed uh, within my party, I was uh, quite vociferous against uh, removing uh, charitable status. However, I have to say, uh, that having read your submission, um, you do present uh, a very strong argument uh, for the issue, particularly when, when you consider um, the uh, difference between, uh, I think you used Wester Hales as an example, um, you know, which has a high area of deprivation. I think, I think the papers mentioned 40% uh, require school meals. Um, so I have to say, you know, given, given the argument that you're putting forward, um, uh, it, it, it's, it's a strong one. Um, and I would uh, thank you for bringing it to the uh, committee's attention. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. I uh, can move on now to Anne McTaggart. Thanks, convener, and thank you, Ashley. That was a most certainly robust presentation that you gave, and thank you for that. Um, just really to say that... Um, it's not really any questions, but an observation. Looking at what you've said today, has can you say alarm bells ringing? Um, I do have some schools within my area that I, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, that I will be looking at um, with what you've said in mind. But I would be interested to hear or, or to continue with the petition. I know we're not at that stage yet, but um, I know that there's other information that I would love to be hearing um, to make some more decisions on it. But thank you very much for your presentation. That, thank you for that thank question. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. I can now bring some um, other questioners. Um, I'm bringing Chick Brodie in. If, uh, and, uh, could I bring in David Chance first, because he hasn't had an interruption, and then Chick Brodie. Good morning, 
Um, you're talking about charitable status for um, private schools here, but local authorities across Scotland, and I come from one where I was a local councillor, moved their sports and leisure into charitable status, moved their arts and uh, libraries into charitable status, and are now considering moving some of our schools into charitable status. So if the local authorities are being able to do that, how can you um, compare the two then to stop basically uh, independent schools not becoming charitable states? What is your point that state schools can be awarded charitable status? Yes. Yes, um, yeah, I, I think it is a separate issue. The comparison is important, but it is a separate issue. And as I said in response to an earlier question, I would completely welcome all state schools having charitable status, but that doesn't in any way lessen my belief that private schools should not have it. So yeah, I guess I'd call for a complete reversal, take it away from private schools and give it to state schools. Cassie, thank you. Right, thank you, Mr. Jones. Uh, could bring in Trick Brody again? Yeah, sorry, <coughs> again, Ashley. Just in, in the current state of affairs, the um, charities pay no corporation tax on profits from trading. And effectively, these schools, as I see them, are a business selling education. So they pay no corporation yes, tax. Just, le just let me develop this. They pay no corporation tax on profits, which would, might include income from the sale of assets. They, under stamp duty, they, they had tax relief. And so that's continued, I believe, on the land and building transaction tax. Isn't that a great incentive for, and I'm not suggesting they all rush out and do it today, for uh, public schools to sell and lease back their buildings where they could pay no tax on the profitability of selling their, their buildings, which must be huge given the age of them. And uh, they pay no tax uh, or, or little tax on the, uh, on the transaction of, of leasing. I mean, that's standard business practice in, in some cases. So they are businesses, aren't they? Yes, they are. I completely agree with you. And that's, I think it's almost misleading to even refer to them as schools because what they are is they're, they're profit-making institutions who sell general compulsory education. Thank, uh, thank you, Mr Brody. Um, I'm just wondering if Mr Carlo Yost should come back in again. We've got a little bit of time. I'm not sure how productive that would be. Uh, there was one point I did want to ask because I think it's slightly misleading to suggest that all bursaries are at 100%. Um, there are many independent schools, I understand, where the level of bursary that is offered to a pupil is a variable between 100% uh, and another figure. Uh, I, however, I think in so far as we follow the petition up, uh, convener, I think Mr Brodie's question was a perfectly legitimate one at the start, which is to try and establish the extent to which bursaries are available. But I think simply to focus on the number of 100% bursaries is perhaps not a reasonable or, a, or a, a fair interpretation of the extent to which bursaries are granted. I do want to return, because I think you, you, you rather glossed over it, um, because your definition of um, uh, access to the schools and the benefit that they gave was entirely in relation to the pupils who are studying there, whereas many of these schools have quite significantly as a result of the charitable status test which has been introduced and which some of them have had to adjust their policies to, to comply with, made their wider school facilities available to the community at large. It, it, it wasn't something they did before, it was something they did as a result of the charitable status being extended. And there are many community groups now who are able to, able to use school facilities at weekends and in the evening, uh, some of which are excellent facilities, uh, who would otherwise be denied doing so. So I just worry that I understand the higher principle you have in this, but I wonder if you understand the wider consequences potentially that would accrue from some of the suggestions that you're making. As I said earlier, the, there is some benefit provided by private schools, but it is more than outweighed by the disbenefit of private schools to society. I, and I'm not going to shake on that principle. It's far too important. Uh, and, and secondly, I don't doubt for a second that if private schools want, if, if they were to lose their charitable status, I don't doubt for a second that they could still provide these services if they so wish to. Tis the services became provided because they were complying 
with the charitable status uh, provisions. Um, but I, I, I think I'm content to leave no. uh, the no. questioning there. Thank you, Mr. Carlo. Um, do any other members have any urgent points? If not, I'm conscious that uh, your time for video conferencing is coming to an end. Uh, um, yes. But if there's no further questions, we're now going to the summation where we've stopped asking you questions and you've stopped asking us questions, and that's to, for the committee to consider the next steps. Um, clearly, I'm sure the committee would agree we need to ask the Scottish Government uh, their views, since the Scottish Government are responsible for laying down the rules, if you like. But it did occur to me that, that since Oscar, um, who are effectively the organisation that carry out the administration and assessment of the rules, it might be useful, and the committee might find it useful if we get Oscar to come in in a future meeting and talk to us and give some evidence about this. But can I ask, first of all, what the committee's views are? That A, we ask Scottish Government the views in the petition. Secondly, we obviously we ask Oscar, the Office of the Scottish Charity Regulator, but perhaps to get them to come in and talk about the day-to-day -day reality. How would committee feel if we ask them to come in at a future meeting? Okay. I also think it's useful that we um, invite the views of COSLA, because obviously this is very important, the Scottish Council of Independent Schools. But, um, it's a point I think John Wilson of, often raises. It might also be useful if we ask a couple of the independent stroke private schools for their views to give us a bit of flavour of this, and clearly we can ask the clerk to give us a cross-section. You know, would have been to approach the Scottish Council for Independent yeah. yes. Schools, uh, who I'm sure would be able to provide a lot of the more the, detailed information yes. the committee might think valuable. I think, think a sensible point. Talk to the wider charitable yes. advantage to the community. That's a good point. Can I, can I bring in John Wilson and then Chip Brody? Thank you, Convener. The, if we're, I agree we should write to the organisations you've so far mentioned, but could I suggest we also write to the EIS to ask, given this is an education issue, uh, to find out what the EIS's views may be on the continued use of independent schools. The, when we're writing to Oscar, I would also like to forewarn them, if that's the best phrase to use, about a particular question, and that question would be, on what grounds were FETIs allowed to amend the registration with Oscar to allow them to continue to receive charitable status? Uh, because I think it's important uh, to find out uh, the, the situation that Oscar decided not to grant charitable status, then subsequently reviewed that uh, decision. It would also be useful to find out how many other independent schools amended the registrations with Oscar to allow them to continue to receive charitable status. Because I'm sure if FETIS was thrown up as an issue in relation to not being able to register for charitable status, then other independent schools, and that may be a question to the Scottish Council of Independent Schools. And further to Mr. Carlaw's assertion that the amendment to the charitable status was mainly due to access to facilities uh, you did mention it, Mr. Carlo, that you, well, you, you stated it, uh, that there was to do with access to facilities uh, at weekends for community organisations. If we ask the Scottish Council of, of Independent Schools, how many hours in the year do independent schools allow access to facilities uh, for communities that surround those facilities and whether or not there are any charges made against that community use for those facilities. Thank you for that. I'm just conscious we're going to lose our petitioner a second because yeah. the window for video conferencing uh, closes. But can I bring in Chick Brody well, quite briefly? Yeah, I, I agree with the point that Jackson made <coughs> earlier and also John asking for information. Certainly, I'd like to see much more, uh, I suppose, being a numerical wonk, uh, information regarding bursars and, uh, and if they have, uh, information regarding the income distribution of... Uh, you, the households yes. that uh, yeah. have pupils attending. Tha thank you for that. So I can just be clear, then, are, <coughs> are the committee um, content with the suggestions that have been identified? I particularly ask for us to seek um, oral evidence from Oscar and some of the points that John Wilson raised could be put to them. Are members, uh, Jackson Carlo? In relation to the points John Wilson made, they weren't secret. They were the matter of public record. All of these matters were widely reported in the press where any school has failed to meet the charitable test, why that was, and the subsequent reassessment by Oscar 
has always been a matter of public record. So it's not that any of this has been hidden from yes. public view. It, it, they publish the report okay. and media widely have covered yep. the instances yep. where a school has failed to comply. Because I think we, the committee have got a very comprehensive list of organisations we're going to consult. But just to confirm, the committee are happy that we have Oscar in front of us at a future meeting yep. to look at this. Yep. Is that our committee content with the various points I've raised? Yep. Right, thank you. Can I, can I thank very much our uh, petitioner who's going to disappear in a second, judging by the notes on the screen. Can I thank you very much for your um, evidence? I think you gave uh, a very articulate uh, view of your thoughts behind the petition. Um, as you can see, we're taking the petition very seriously and the clerks will keep you up to date with the developments and I hope the weather improves in Orkney um, as it will hopefully here as well. So thank you very much for giving up your time and I really enjoyed your evidence. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your time and your consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as we can just conclude the video conferencing, I'll just go straight on to the uh, next item of business, which is the second new petition is PE1527 by Margaret McKenzie on bank deposit uh, protection. Members, a note by the clerk and the petition. Um, uh, committee members will be aware that the petition um, was uh, uh, set up on the basis that there would be a yes vote in the referendum and without dragging the committee into the views whether there should be a yes vote or a no vote, which I suspect would take us some time. Uh, since that wasn't factually what happened, my suggestion is that we merely close this petition. I obviously thank the petitioner um, for her work putting forward this petition. Thank you, Grebel. Thank you for that. Uh, can we move on to agenda item three, consideration of current petitions. Um, the next um, item, is, the first item we have is PE1408 by Andrea MacArthur on the updating of pernicious anemia, oblique vitamin B12 deficiency, understanding and treatment. Members of the note by the clerk and the submissions um, could invite um, uh, contributions from members. I think members will appreciate this has been a, a very, very good uh, petition, which I think we had uh, a plenary session on some time ago. Uh, there is some suggestions for action, which I would certainly endorse, which is writing to the uh, Scottish Government to seek an update on the outcome of the diagnostic screening group's consideration of issues raised by BCSH guidelines following the November meeting. Um, Luke asked uh, the Scottish Government to seek its views on the petitioner's concern about patients who might benefit from more frequent injections. And finally, its views and suggestion that the guidelines be included in the British National uh, Formulary. Could I ask members' views of whether they, that's acceptable for action? I, 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 <coughs> no, I agree, but, but I think the, the, the um, letter of 6 of October um, I was, I'm not sure whether that's been drawn to the attention of the government or not, but uh, you know, just highlighting the concerns that, yes. you know, that, that Andrea still has. It was definitely. I think we'll make sure that's very clear, Mr. Burry. Thank you for that. Um, then I move on to the next. Uh, sorry, John Wilson, before we move. Thank you, Convener. Given I've got a particular interest in this, and I'll declare an interest as a very close family member has pernicious anemia and depends on regular injections uh, to cope with the condition. Uh, the, in the letter from the Scottish Government on the 4th of August, a uh, paragraph that basically uh, reads further, we have also received advice that dissemination of these guidelines in their current form to GPs could be unhelpful as they are not presented in a suitable format for use in the practice setting. When we're writing to the Scottish Government, can I ask uh, that we ask the Scottish Government when the guidance will be issued in a suitable format for GPs, as GPs are very much uh, in the front line of dealing with uh, patients who have pernicious anemia. And I still hear of cases where patients who are trying to get more regular uh, injections to deal with pernicious anemia are being refused by the GPs and by practice nurses because they continue to indicate that they have some form of guidance which, of course, the Minister has told us in the past there is no guidance in terms of the treatment of pernicious anemia, but it would be useful to find out when the guidance or the, the information will be available in a useful format for GPs. Is there any further contributions? Um, obviously, I'm sure members will wish to endorse John Wilson's comments as well. Um, is that agreeable? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much for, for that. We move then to the next petition. It's PE1446 by Dr. Eliza Morton on Scottish standards for the care of adult congenital heart patients, members of a note by the clerk. Um, could invite contributions from members. There is obviously um, a recommendation that we um, uh, consider whether we now wish to seek a formal update from the Scottish Government, which seemed to me to be a sensible course of action. Are members agreeable yeah. that course of action? Thank you for that. 
And the next petition is PE 1453 by Callan Wilson on behalf of the Evening Times and Kidney Research UK Scotland on an opt-out system of organisation in Scotland. Members of a note by uh, the clerk. Um, again, I'm sure all members would wish to thank uh, Karen Wilson um, and the Evening Times and all the work they've done. The committee's done, I think, a lot of work on this. I think it's a first-class um, petition. And I do note that um, um, Amit Taggart has got a member's bill on this issue has been uh, lodged. Um, I think on the basis that the, that the Scottish Government's made its position very clear and that we've got a member's bill, the committee may now uh, close the petition in the sense that we've gone probably as far as we can. But obviously, uh, as always, I'm open to any other contributions from members. Chip Brody? Yeah. Yeah. Can I say this? I say this with the best intention. That when we went through this and we discussed this with the Welsh organisation, we talked mm. to the Government, that it was my hope that, that because I have sympathy for, for the, the petition, it was my hope that once we had all of that information that um, we could perhaps ensure that um, the required change was made. Yeah. I'm not sure, and I say this as I say, with the best of intentions, that the Members' Bill is not going to create a, a dissension, certainly taking the Government's position, in, 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 and might, in fact, impact, if not damage, a, the output from this petition, which we, mm. you know, I think we all basically all shared. Yeah. I, am I just wish we'd waited until we had more information. Um, I'm going to bring in Amitag. <coughs> Obviously, the position that we're currently at is to decide what the committee itself no, can do, I, because I, I clearly don't we don't have a particular locus of what individual members do, and although. Uh, uh, the member happens to be here, uh, and that's secondary to um, uh, Amit Taggart's role on the committee. Um, Amit Taggart. Thanks, convener. And yes, I do declare an interest. I have um, the consultation period has now closed, and given that I'm able to share with the committee, there was 556. Um, and from that 560. 56 responses, about 80% of them um, were for a change in, in the law. Um, so, convener, I would be I would be quite concerned if we were closing it. Um, and, and I hear what you're saying about the, the committee have done all that they can do. I think there's still more to be done. There's still more happening out there. Um, and I'm aware that the petitioner herself had attended the Kidney Foundation um, forum at the weekend there. I, I just think there's still more to be done within the, the, the committee itself. Yeah. Sure. I mean, I think um, I can't necessarily speak for all members, but clearly... Um, I think during the course of the debate, I think all members appreciated the great work being done by the petitioner and the Evening Times on this. So I think there's a lot of sympathy and goodwill here. My point merely on the management of this is, what else does this committee do? If there's another practical next step, I would be the first on the barricades to demand it. Uh, so that is really a practical managerial uh, advice I would like. Uh, Jackson Carlo? Um, yes, convener. I'm very much in sympathy with the view you promote. The practical next step is, in fact, the Members' Bill, which um, Anne McTaggart is taking forward. Uh, I have my own views on where I think the balance of evidence presently lies, but given that there is a Members' Bill being taken forward, it's difficult to know what this committee itself would now seek to do to advance the petition further. Uh, and uh, on that basis, I'm content that the future progress of it is through the Members' Bill rather than, rather than through the committee. And, um, Angus MacDonald? Yes, thanks, Convener. I would agree with uh, Jackson, Carlo, and uh, Chick Brody um, uh, that, that there seems little um, purpose for the, the petition to be kept open, uh, given that there is uh, a Member's Bill uh, in, in prog progress. So uh, I would agree with uh, the comments already made. Yeah. Um, I mean, one. Um, I mean, first of all, so I'm delighted that uh, Amit Tag has taken forward the Members' Bill. That, is, uh, uh, that may not have happened had we had not had this petition and this committee had this debate. I mean, clearly, if we took a scenario where 
uh, we closed the petition. Clearly, if anything happened to members' bill, for example, it didn't go forward. Uh, there's nothing stopping within the time period this petition being reintroduced. And I'm sure the committee would want to look at it again. So I think there is tremendous goodwill uh, amongst this committee for this, uh, the principle behind it. My point is merely looking at what next practical step we can do and that we're not wanting to duplicate uh, the parliamentary work, which is rightly the members' bill. Um, Target, do you want to come back? Yeah. Um, the, the petition, most certainly, and, and, and I'm aware we have done loads of work on it. However, um, there is still ongoing work that I think the committee still should be involved in and should still keep the petition open. The British Heart Foundation in Scotland has commissioned a poll by Ipsos Mori um, that to the introduction of the soft opt-out system. Um, that, that poll is due to come back um, within the next few weeks, and I think it would be important for the committee for to have a look at um, the figures that come back from that and the, obviously the outcome of, of, of that poll itself. Okay, uh, can you bring in Chick Brody? Yeah, on that point, I mean, and, and of course no one questions the motivation behind uh, Anne McTaggart's bill. The problem is, you know, I agree with, with Jackson and, and Angus, the thing is, if the bill falls, let's say, then what do we do after that? Where well, there's a degree of sympathy uh, for, for the petition, uh, you know, we, we're talking about it's still going on. Well, I think the member's bill will just about, you know, it's on the head. Um, and it would be a difficult recovery situation, should it fall. I'm not saying it will, but should it fall. So, um, yeah, I think we should wait until the member's bill, and we should close it and, and let the member's bill go ahead. Uh, Jason Carla? The only caveat I would say, convener, is you know, I'm obviously sympathetic to any member of the committee who has a very strong personal wish to see a petition continued. It's something I've expressed before, and sometimes colleagues have supported me in, in that request. Um, and although I don't think we're being invited to take any additional formal practical action, um, if it would assist a member of the committee that we keep the bill open, not, the petition open, notwithstanding the fact that I think the argument is more in line with closing it, I would be happy for it to remain open until a subsequent meeting when we could look at it again uh, in the light of anything that might have arisen, uh, 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 if that helps Anne McTaggart. Yeah, I think that's um, obviously it's a matter for other members, but if members feel that we should defer this and for a future occasion, and by that time we'll probably have an update on where the bill is, I I'm certainly comfortable with that. But I would like to bring in my colleagues. No, 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 I, I, I yeah. mean, I'm happy to do that. I mean, it's yeah. just a question that, that you know, in the course of the, the debate on the bill, there will be various, and most of the points will be brought forward. Yeah. But, yeah, rather John, than kill the stone dead, then we should keep it open. John, John Wilson? I, like other <coughs> members, and you've outlined, convener, the procedure that we can close this petition at the present time. However, if Anne McTaggart's private member's bill wasn't, uh, I, you know, progressed, then certainly the petitioner has the right to come back to this committee with and reopen the petition. So I'm quite content that we close it at the present moment and with the proviso the petitioner is made aware they can come back at a later date if things don't go well with the members' bill. Sorry, I think, just to be clear, I think Jackson Carroll is suggesting that we, yeah, uh, keep, we keep this open yeah. uh, uh, pro tem and consider it a future date. Uh, the only problem I have is, is at what future date do we consider it? Mm -hmm. uh, given the time that it may take to take, put the Members' Bill through Parliament and for an outcome to be reached for that uh, for the, in the time space, and that means this petition stays on the committee's books until such times as that, that outcome has been reached. I, think, Jackson, Carol, again. I don't think I would support that, but I, I thought uh, Anne McTaggart was suggesting there might be some further information that becomes available in the immediate future which we would be able to judge whether it did encourage us or prompt us to ask any further question ourselves. I think perhaps if it didn't at that stage, um, I wouldn't be suggesting the petition simply stay open for the duration of any member's bill, and only because one of our, member, one of our colleagues feels very strongly that we should, and uh, I'm happy to facilitate yeah. that for a period mm. of two or three months. If that yeah, helps. so we're talking about perhaps, you know, this, we have a deadline for the early spring that we'd sign. If there's no further action, we can close at that date. John Wilson? Can I seek clarification? If we keep this petition open, the Members' Bill is likely to be referred to the Health Committee, as I understand it. So we would have a petition 
still live with this committee, potentially, and a member's bill going to another committee, at what stage can they recons reconsider that petition? And I, I do think we need to, because when we refer a petition on to a committee, then it becomes the property of that committee. Uh, so it's really trying to be clear that if it's the health committee this member's bill will be referred to, then it becomes yeah. the property of the health committee to deal with as they see yeah. fit. Yeah. Uh, and it no longer lies in the jurisdiction of the, this committee. Well, I think the point that John Wilson is probably sensibly making is wh why then as a compromise don't we refer this immediately to health committee on the basis that's f the committee is going to look at uh, Alma Target's bill? And that all the evidence and work we've done will be considered by our colleagues um, who are going to consider the members' bill. Uh, Angus MacDonald. Yeah. Um, well, just to say, convener, that sounds like a, a fair compromise to me. Uh, okay. Thank you. Are other members content? Chair yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I thank Mr. Uh, Mr. Wilson, <coughs> also known as Henry Kissinger, who's very good at uh, these compromises. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And, uh, again, I want to thank the, uh, Caroline Wilson in Evening Times and Amit Taggart for the work she's done on the Member's Bill. Uh, if I can move to our next petition, it's PE 1458 by Peter Cherby on the Register of Interest for Members, Register of, Interest for members of Scotland's Judiciary. Members have a note by the clerk on submissions. Um, members will know that we had, um, this has been a long hard work saga for, I think, for the committee. And could I thank all members, incidentally, for the very thoughtful contributions that all members put forward in the plenary session uh, that we had. Uh, Mr. Cherby has written to us uh, suggesting that we keep a careful note of the annual report or, uh, by the Judicial Complaints Reviewer uh, for 2014. He also invited us to invite in turn Kenny McCaskill to appear um, before the committee to talk particularly about the judicial um, oaths issue. Um, and there's also, I think, an argument that we write to the Lord President seeking an update on changes to the rules of complaints about the judiciary. So I think there's a few issues for members uh, to look at, but could I ask members' views on whether th these suggestions would be acceptable to members of the committee? Uh, Chip Brody? Uh, yes, Kimia. Um, this is a saga that will not go away. A couple of things. One is the um, JCR has left. Um, as, I'm as far as I'm aware, there's no announced replacement. In addition to yeah. which, pardon? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, just to interrupt, but I understand that the government has now appointed a new judicial okay. complaints reviewer. Probably done during recess. Um, however, it's important that we receive the report uh, from the, JC, the JCR mm -hmm. uh, unexpurgated so that we can uh, take a definitive view of somebody who's close to the, to yeah. the problem. And also we should uh, ensure that the Lord President is, of course, encouraged to uh, let us know as soon as possible what changes have been made to rules mm -hmm. on the complaints. And he will, of course, have had the report from the JCR. Thank, uh, you. thank, you. thank you for that. Can I ask members specifically <coughs> whether... Um, Members agree with Mr. Cherby's suggestion that we invite Ken McCaskill to appear before us. Mr. Brody? Yes. Mr. Wilson? Yes. Yes. Saggart? Yes. 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 Thank you for that. Um, and the other specific point, which I think makes sense, is to obviously get the annual report from JCR, and um, we obviously we can have that in a written format uh, since the, the previous JCR uh, has left. And also, our committee agreeable that we write to Lord President seeing an update on changes to the rules of complaints about the judiciary. Um, and there was, as I think I raised and other members raised, in fairness, there was a change to the uh, uh, recusals. That is where a judge decides not to take part in a case because of some conflict. There now is a, a register of that uh, since April this year, which I think I identified in my speech at the time. I spoke, I think there was 14. So there now is a website that you can go on, and that is an improvement. And to be fair, I'm glad the Lord President has taken this on board. I think this is this has helped. I'm not suggesting this fully satisfies the petitioner, but um, a move in the right direction is always welcome. Mr. Wilson? Thank you, Convener. I agree that we have moved in, in terms of the direction of travel relating to the petition. Uh, and while I accept your comment about the register of recusals now being available on the website. 
I, I would seek clarification f from the Lord President as to whether or not these are voluntary recusals, uh, because the, there may be still judges sitting in cases uh, where they may have an interest, and it's only and just for clarification to find out whether or not, because I, I know there is a, a recent case where a judge recused themselves because they were a member of a, an organisation that was about to hear a case. But it's just that because we still don't have a register of interest for judges, then is it still very much up to the individual judge to decide whether or not they feel it is relevant that they, they recuse themselves from a case? Yeah, obviously it's been a matter for the Lord President to give you a definitive answer, but my understanding from the discussions I had with them along with Mr Brodie and my reading of the, the website with the 14 at the time recusals, these were all recusals because there was a conflict. Mostly it was about personal issues. For example, a judge would know a, a witness uh, and as far as I could see, there was no financial issues at all. I, I'm not sure what involuntary recusals there are. In all these cases, the, the judge said, there is a conflict, I do not want to appear in this case. But we, that's maybe a matter we need to get some um, comments from the Lord President. Um, I was going to suggest we invite him here, but I think we've been there before. Um, Jackson Carlo? Yeah, uh, can I again say that I think the recommendations that have been made are appropriate. Can I just say, with reference to the debate, that subsequently the Law Society of Scotland were very keen to reassure me that any uh, indirect briefing I may have had or received which suggested they regarded the value of this committee as being any less than any other committee of the Parliament uh, certainly did not represent their views, and I was happy to accept that reassurance, uh, given that the impression might have, I think, in the debate been created that Lord President had somehow felt that this committee was one he would prefer not to appear before because it wasn't covering weighty matters that required his direct attention. Well, I, I'm happy to reassure, be reassured that that's not the Law Society's view. Yeah. I'm very pleased, uh, Mr Carroll, that you've raised this and uh, that the Law Society have put that comments to you. I'm, I, I'm glad that now this is on the record. Um, is there any further comments then? So are members satisfied with their course of action? That A, we are inviting Mr McCaskill to appear before us. Secondly, that we are going to get in written format the annual report from JCR, which obviously we can discuss when it comes before us. And we're going to write to the Lord President seeing an update and changes to rules and complaints about judiciary. And in particular, we want to identify Mr Wilson's point, which is about, um, is there uh, this creature about involuntary um, recusal? In other words, where it's not something the judge himself wishes to raise, but he's been approached, or she's been approached, not to take the case. Is that a fair summary? Mr Wilson, thank you. Is that fair? Well, Mr Brody? i just come back to the JCR's report, and I'm not suggesting that anything uh, would be done that was, was wrong, but given the strength of view that the incumbent had regarding the register of interests, I think it's very important that we understand that we see, if you like, the, the naked report, mm -hmm. because uh, I think that's quite important, that, yes, that we, we get a, a valuation of a true valuation, mm. to see if anything has moved on. Yes. <coughs> Angus MacDonald? Following on from that, with regard to the uh, Judicial Complaints Review's report, uh, do we have a timescale of, of when it is due? I mean, we, according to the petitioner's letter, it's uh, due um, soon. Yes. But I, I mean, my assumption is that it is um, it's, uh, almost a pause, because obviously the previous... Uh, Digital Complaints Reviewer has completed her term of office, um, so I would assume that the work in 2014 that she's been part of uh, will be available very soon, but we'll ask the, the clerks to chase that one up. Uh, uh, John Wilson? Yeah. Can we know, just so, so when the clerks are chasing it up, could we get clarification when the report produced by the Judicial Complaints Reviewer was submitted to the Lord President? Because my understanding is that report may be on the desk of the Lord President at the present moment. Yeah. And given that the Judicial Complaints Reviewer gave up post yeah. during the summer, then it would be interesting to find out when the report will be released. Yes, that's a good point. Thank you for that. Are members agreeable with that, courses of, that course of action? Thank you for that. Yeah. If I move then to the next petition, PE 1480 by Amanda Coppell on behalf of the Frank Coppell uh, Alzheimer's Awareness Campaign uh, on Dementia Awareness. Members have a note by the clerk um, could invite contributions from members, uh, but with the caveat that it might be sensible to write to the Scottish Government seeking an update 
um, because we want to be informed of developments um, and perhaps keep petition open meantime to monitor progress. John Wilson. Yeah, could it, for writing to the Scottish Government, can I suggest we write to the Scottish Government to ask them whether or not they are intending to uh, take up the same position as the health board, uh, the, the UK government have yes. taken in relation to the uh, effect effectively what some have described as a bounty for GPs to yes. identify no. dementia oh, yeah. patients. Also, perhaps it's worth clarifying because I think it was uh, I had a question to Michael Matheson about free personal care for under 65 year olds who have dementia. And I think on memory there was around 7,000 uh, in that category. And he certainly said he was going to look, look at that issue. I don't know if members of, are more up to date than I am on this one, but it might be worth just clarifying from the uh, Cabinet Secretary what the position is, because that would be a huge help to under 65 year olds who have dementia. Can, can just, uh, um, no, Chip Brody? I uh, <clears throat> was in. Sorry, last week, my daughter's wedding. But, um, in the course of that, there was a welter of, of commentary about the NHS in England and also the NHS England vis-a-vis -vis that in Wales. Uh, but, and, and this is not a light-hearted matter, but it just shows you there was a cartoon in the Daily Mail with, where a nurse was showing in three young children, you know, five-year-old, six-year-old, uh, saying, uh, here's another three candidates for uh, dementia uh, approval because of this £55 per head. Mm. I mean, I, I think there's, a, there's an element that suggests we, we, mm. we, we should um, look at the, the care for those aged under 65, but I think you're right that, that we need to get the government's update yes. on where they are, and, and as John rightly said, in relation to uh, what is happening elsewhere. Is that agreeable? Uh, right, thank you for that. Um, we'll go on to the next petition. It's PE 1495 by Rob Wilson and the use of gagging clauses and agreements with NHS staff in Scotland. Members of a note by the clerk. Uh, can I write contributions from members? Obviously, there are um, a number of options um, here. Um, we can defer consideration until March, to the, uh, March next year. And request the committee's copied into the Scottish Government's report to the Public um, Audit Committee. Uh, Jackson Cobb. Okay. Are members agreeable? Yep. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, the next petition is PE uh, 1505 by Jackie Watt on awareness of strep B in pregnancy and infants. Um, there is a suggestion that we write to Scottish Government and NHS Health Scotland seeking confirmation that a full review is planned. Uh, this year, and the petition suggestion will be taken uh, account of at that time. Yeah. Members all agree well? John Wilson. Mayor, can I raise my concern about the submission made by the petitioner in relation to the consultation about the, what was described as minor changes uh, to the guidance? And it's really just to make NHS Scotland aware that you know, seven days' notice or six days' notice of uh, engagement to put forward amendments to a document is insufficient and that we as a committee would be seeking meaningful dialogue and consultation with the petitioner regarding changes to any guidance that's issued because as I said the petitioner has raised it quite clearly that even though she did meet the timetable in terms of having submissions in by the 30th of June uh, that she feels that none of her suggestions were taken up. But it's, it's just raising the issue about the consultation period, sure. and we'd expect it to be much longer. Members agreeable with John Wilson's suggestion? Uh, thank you. I, um, the next petition is PE 1515 by uh, Mick Napier on asylum in Scotland to Glasgow University Rector Edward Snowden. Members have a note by the clerk. Mr. Uh, um, Bowie's suggestion we close it on the basis that the petition is premised on a majority vote for independence. Is that agreeable? Thank you for that. Uh, next petition is PE1518 by George Chalmers on meaningful public consultation within the Scottish planning system. Uh, members of a note by the clerk can invite contributions from members. There's clearly a, a fairly lengthy uh, um, option um, or series of options for this petition um, in terms of follow up to Scottish Government. Um, I would suggest that we go ahead on the series of these um, options as outlined. Um, in the clerk's report. Uh, John Wilson. 
Convener, uh, I think there was a very <coughs> helpful uh, letter from the Scottish Government uh, which attached a consultation exercise that took place uh, and, or a survey uh, that was, was commissioned by the Scottish Government to look at the planning uh, issues within local authorities and how they advertised uh, and placed planning applications on the local government websites. Uh, having read the results of the, the survey that was carried out, uh, I would like to, if it's possible, to ask uh, the Scottish Government what action, if any, was taken to discuss uh, the outcomes of the, the survey that was carried out and whether or not there were any suggested changes to local authorities. Because if you look at the scoring matrix in relation to the survey that was carried out, then quite clearly uh, there are a, almost a majority of uh, local authorities that scored below 50% in terms of the survey that was carried out. And it would be useful just to find out uh, what exactly is happening uh, in the Scottish Government to ensure that we are convinced that the, the appropriate consultation is taking place with communities by local authorities in relation to planning applications uh, being submitted. Thank you for that. And I think I would particularly flag up to members um, asking the Scottish Government about the alleged practice of phasing applications to avoid the obligations for major development. That, is, that was, I think, the major thrust of the points made by the petitioner. Are members agreeable with the points laid out in the clerk's report in addition to John Wilson's contribution? Is that agreed? Thank yes. you. The final current petition is PE 1519 by John F. Robbins on behalf of the Save Our uh, Seals Fund on Saving Scotland Seals. Members have a note by the clerk and submissions. Uh, given the sponsors received and recognising that the work is ongoing, the committee may wish to refer this petition to the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee to consider in the context of their work. Is that agreeable? Thank you for that. Um, and if I can move then to agenda item four, inquiry into tackling child sexual exploitation in Scotland. And then outside... Um, Jackson Carlow. Petitions. Sorry, it occurs to be an oversight on my part, and I think this is what John Wilson was alluding to earlier, and I had fully intended, before we took evidence this morning, to say that I had myself been a product of and a user of the independent education sector, was briefly a governor before being elected here, and on one occasion undertook a uh, commercial consultancy, a short commercial consultancy for an independent school. I had all that to say and then completely forgot. Yes, I think John Wilson was trying to prompt me at one point and it was only later that I realised right. that's what he'd been trying no, to no. do. We're very happy to add that to the official record, Mr Carlo. Thank you. Um, I, agenda item four, as I said, is tackling uh, child sexual exploitation in Scotland. Uh, before considering the letter, um, we, I would like just to acknowledge the recent evidence session that the Justice Committee has had with the Solicitor General and Police Scotland around use of the Protection of Children and Prevention of Sexual Offences Scotland Act 2005. Uh, members will know this is something that was raised, particularly by Bernardo's, and it was felt that we really needed to... Look we need to look in more detail about uh, this particular issue. Um, there was a number of issues here. I understand that there has been, been followed up by the Justice Committee in relation to numbers of prosecutions. Uh, in terms of the committee's follow-up uh, at uh, its inquiry, at the meeting of the, the 17th of June, the committee agreed to wait sight of the National Action Plan, which was expected to be published over the summer. Uh, the letter from the Minister, however, provides an update but advises the plan will not be available until November. Uh, members have the Minister's letter. Can I now invite contributions from members? Chip Brody? Yes. Um, I think I said in the, in the debate that we had, <coughs> do we ignore this at our peril? I am, and, and just to show you know, that how an acquiescent backbencher I am, I'm absolutely, I'm not sure whether I'm angry or disappointed that we, just before recess, started talking about what we're going to do about this. It was a very full and comprehensive inquiry which mm. embraced goodness knows how many witnesses. A, if it's lying on somebody's office shelf, I'd like to understand why, uh, why we're also going, going, you know, reinventing the wheel. Uh, and I think there, is a, a, there should be a request from this uh, committee, a fairly robust uh, question as to why this was not given the attention um, or why it 
isn't being given the attention uh, that it deserves. I mean, we are reacting, I suspect, to what happened in Rotherham now, when in fact we, on our own doorstep, have issues that uh, we have to address. Thank you for that. Other members wish to <coughs> contribute? I think you know, my own view, again, I would like to thank the committee and the witnesses um, and the clerks um, and our advisor for all the work that we uh, carried out. I think this was a very, very important inquiry. Um, subsequent events, um, not just in England, Wales, Northern Ireland, and Scotland, have, uh, have perhaps come to uh, reinforce the fact that our, our recommendations, I think, were very, very appropriate uh, indeed. And I'm very keen that this, our, all the work we've done doesn't get forgotten about. But obviously, in November, we will have um, the Minister's views and we will obviously want to debate this again. John Wilson. Mayor, can I say that in support of Chuck Brodie, uh, the situation or the landscape is moving on almost on a daily basis in terms of child sexual exploitation. Uh, the Rotherham case is only one of many that we're now becoming aware of. Uh, we need to, and we did seek assurances when we carried out our own inquiry as to ensure that procedures and practices were in place in Scotland to ensure that we wouldn't have a repeat of the situation that's happening south of the border in Scotland. Now, I'm not entirely convinced the, the practices in place and some of the, the allegations that are being made now clearly indicate that there may have been some issues around child sexual exploitation in Scotland. Now, I'd remind you that the minister's letter actually says, I hope to be in a position to provide you with a copy in November of the plan. The difficulty is, is I would want to seek assurances that that national action plan will be available in November, not I will hope to be able to provide you with a copy of the plan in November, because the time has moved on there has been slippage in terms of the reporting back to this committee and I would seek assurances that we could actually have a national action plan in front of this committee before we, uh, Christmas period yeah. uh, and I would ask if we could write to yes. the Scottish Government seeking clarification that the national action plan will be with us yeah. before the end of this year. I would agree with uh, my colleagues uh, Chip Brody and John Wilson about this. I think it's important that we put a very um, strongly worded letter to the Minister saying that we really would like to see this work completed uh, before Christmas so we can discuss this as a committee before Christmas. Could you, with, with all due respect, I, mean, I know that we've got to go through all the proprieties of, of process. You know, we could draw up an action plan by Friday by taking the recommendations yes. from our sexual exploitation inquiry. Yes. Why aren't we doing that? Mm. Why are we wasting more public money on having another inquiry and an inquiry and an inquiry? Yeah. It's, frankly, it's not good enough, and the, the letter should be as strong as it, as it, as it mm. could be possibly be yeah. made. Yeah, I think your, your comments are well made, but obviously they're <laughs> well made towards the Scottish Government Minister. <laughs> it's the, committee has done, the committee has done the work, and uh, we now want to see some action. Um, so I, I would agree with the points Chip Brody has made. Our committee agreeable, then, that um, a suitably worded letter will go ASAP. Uh, and again, thank the committee for all the work that they have done and their commitment to this issue. Um, agenda item five is Scotland's National Action Plan on Human Rights, abbreviated as SNAP. Um, the next item of business is consideration of Scotland's National Action Plan on Human Rights. Members have a note by the clerk. Members will recall that at the business planning discussion, Professor Alan Miller, Chair of the Scottish Human Rights Commission, spoke about SNAP and the interface between the Scottish Human Rights Commission and SNAP process and the Parliament. The committee agreed to consider whether it would wish to have any formal involvement in this. It seems to me there's probably two two uh, main ways forward. Uh, one is, having noted involvement in the Justice Committee in this, the Public Petitions Committee may consider it does not wish to seek a formal role at the time, but before the, in advance of the Justice Committee's debate in December, we may wish to invite Professor Miller to provide either a no or all written briefing. The other option, of course, is we appoint our own rapporteur in this case, um, in which case it would be interesting to see if the members are wishing to volunteer for that role. So I see that as the two main uh, uh, ways forward, and I'm just in interested to hear what the committee's views um, are on this. Chip Brody? Right. <coughs> John Wilson? I agree with you. Right. Um, can I suggest then um, that we, we ask uh, Professor Miller to provide us um, with a, a written briefing on the work um, so we consider this in due course? That be agreeable? 
thank you very much. Thank the committee for that. Um, as agreed at item one, the, the committee will now go into private session for the items six and seven of today's agenda and allow a few moments for the public gallery to clear. <laughs>